talking on, it's, we're still in our eschatology series, but what I want to talk about is not letting him escape. That's my title, it's sort of my title today, Don't Let Him Escape. And I want to talk specifically on uh, the Book of Job. Anybody ever read the Book of Job? Anybody ever seen uh, or been quoted verses from the Book of Job? Anybody been ever, ever been scared of the Book of Job? Because it's this guy who really the, the, the devil comes along and conflicts him. That's it, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and sort of afflicts him constantly, uh, takes his family away, he loses his business, he loses all his money, he loses all his friends, except for three friends who you wouldn't really count as friends. And all of this happens to him in a very, very short space of time. Steve, could I ask you to close the door over for me? Thanks. Um, so I want to look at this today. And I want to look at the book of Job, and if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Job 1. And it's verse, let me see, verse uh, 21. Job 1, verse 21. And it says, And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So if we sang the song, Blessed be the name of the Lord, yes. And those who have been here for a while, we are missing probably, which is funny, probably about half of the normal attendees. But um, in that, in that uh, song, I have purposely taken out a chorus. And it's that, he gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. And there's so much religion based upon that line, the Lord, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. You go to a funeral, the Lord took away. But who is it that says this? I've said this before. Who says this? Job. Job. It's not God. And actually, if you read through the whole book of Job, and you get to chapter 42, he repents of it, because the whole book of Job is him coming to the conclusion of, something has happened, my whole life has been destroyed, I've lost my family, all my kids have gone, um, I've lost all my, my money, I've lost all my wealth, I'm now sick, my body's been afflicted. And he's gone through all of this. And the whole wrestling thing that takes place in, jo uh, in the book of Job is him trying to work out why. And if you've ever had something happen to you, if you've ever had something taken away from you, if you've ever had something stolen from you, maybe it's a relationship, time, maybe it's a, a family member, maybe it's a job, and you've had something taken from you, Quite often the question that you come up with is why? You know what's happened. And the usual response is not just why. We tag on a, a word on the end of that. We go, why God? Why God? Why have you let this happen to me? Why have you let me uh, be treated in such a way? Why have you let all of this come against me? Why have you let this happen in such a bad way where now it looks like I'm shamed and it looks like I'm despondent because I don't have anything yet I'm supposed to be a follower of you? And you see, this is wrong theology. I, you'll know if you've ever been in this church, I have a thing about context. The Bible can be taken out of context like that. But if you read things in the context, then everything is explained. And if you take the text out of the context, you're left with a con. And I don't want anybody being forsaken or being lost or being despondent because they've been conned into what they should be believing. The truth is, is God does not take away. In fact, let's, let's look at uh, his character. If you, turn to, if you turn to Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30. And uh, verse 17. In fact, I'm going to read from verse 16. Therefore, all those who devour you shall be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, adversaries, every one of them shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall become plunder, and all who prey on you I will make prey. For I, this is God speaking, will restore health to you, and heal you of your wounds, says the Lord. Because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion. No one seeks her. So basically, he's talking that when something comes against you, when something is taken away from you, whenever uh, somebody has a go, maybe somebody says something about you, God isn't going to let your reputation to be taken away. Instead, he's going to restore it. 
He's going to restore everything to you that has ever been taken because God at his heart is a restorer. He's not someone who gives and then, you know, it's like my kids when they give a present. Uh, I remember one of Brad's first presents to me for my birthday was a dinosaur. Um, and I think that, that he bought that specifically. It was his own money, which, mind you, because he wanted that. So he gave it to me, he says, this is for you, Daddy, and then he walked away with it. <laughs> and quite often, we think of God like that, that God gives you a little bit here, and he says, whoa, taking that back back here, I'm taking it back from you now. You've had it long enough. You've been in a happy relationship long enough. Now I'm just going to take it back, and I'm just going to control it this way, and I'm take it back. And that's not God. First John 4 tells us that God is love. So is it loving? For me to give a present, give a gift, and then take it away at any at no notice at all. That's not loving. But we, we have to be sure about the nature of God. And if you look through the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, you'll see the word restore or restoration over and over again. Because Israel would be the chosen people of God. Then they would be caught in idolatry. They would go, God, yes, thank you for getting us out of Egypt. Thank you for uh, parting the Red Sea. Cheers. But uh, we're going to make a statue and start worshipping it instead. And then they would fall because they're not trusting in God. And then God would have to come along and have to restore them back. That's the God we serve. Someone that wants to give to you. Bring everything back to you. And I want to show you this in Scripture. God is a restorer. And sometimes we can look at the Bible and we can get confused because we see things. And it's on face value. If someone tells you this is what it says, you look at it and you go, yeah, that's what it says. And you take it completely out of context. But I'm telling you right now that God isn't saying, I'm going to take away from you. That was Job. And at the end, God reveals everything. And in fact, does anybody know what happened with the book of Job? The big reveal? What God does? He gives him everything back. He gives him not just everything back. He gives him double for his trouble. He gives him twice as much as he lost. He gives back to him. Because that's the type of God we serve. In fact, um, I am trying to rush through things. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Proverbs. And I want to sort of stay here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6. In fact, before we get there... In the, in the gospel, see on these uh, banners, it says John 10.10, 10, one of my favorite scriptures. It talks about Jesus, it says he came to give you life and life more abundantly. But the rest of that scripture is talking about the thief, Satan. And it says the thief came to, anybody? Steal, kill, and destroy. So who's the thief? The devil. The Satan is the thief. Satan's the one who came along, and if you read the book of Job, at the very start of the book, he's the one who came along and asked permission and tried to take everything away. And God quite rightly said to Satan, everything is in your hands. Because man had fallen and all authority had been left with Satan because man had trusted Satan over God. And because, they had, because he had authority, God rightly said, everything is in your hands. And Satan was the one that took his family away. Satan was the one that stole from him. Satan is the thief, according to John 10. But this is what I want to look at. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30. People do not despise a thief. If he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving, yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. When he is fine. When he is fine. See when you start looking for the trick. See when you start looking at what the devil's doing. The key is to find him. The key is to see what's happening. The key is to see where he is putting his hands on something. And trying to take it away from you. I had this myself. As uh, a lot of you know. Part of my testimony. Um, my marriage was taken away from me. Um, we split. We were getting divorced. We were separated for about a year and a half, living in separate houses. And the thing was, is I was saved at this point, and Kelly wasn't. And we saw things completely differently. Do you know what? You just know the story about us getting married. I got actually saved on my wedding day. When everybody says you should be up to something else, I got saved. And I got back down on my hands and knees and prayed. 
when Kelly was sitting in the corner with two bottles of wine down in them, not even from a glass, from the bottle, classy. And that was the way it was for the start of our relationship. Because we were unequally yoked, we saw things differently. Then my relationship split. And for ages, for, for I don't know, about the first year, I was trying everything I could to win her back. I was trying to impress her. I was trying to look good for her. I went and got a fake tan. <laughs> got my hair tinted. And this is all true. Bought new clothes. Then we come around to her house buying her presents and stuff. And I'd done all this because I thought I can bring her back. And you know when I came to it, I realized that with Kelly leaving, it wasn't actually just, it wasn't really a physical fight between us two. In fact, we never ever fell out. Not, not before the breakup. But when she left, I realized after a while, after about a year, I realized that this is a spiritual warfare happening. This is something in the spirit world trying to break us up. Do you know what it was? I was recognizing that there was a thief trying to destroy things. I was recognizing somebody's fingerprints on the crime. I was recognizing somebody behind the scenes trying to rip us apart. And when I recognized that, I was able, and I remember this very clearly, to stand in the living room, stand up and start praying Matthew 18, 18. Where we have power to bind things on earth that are not in heaven and loose things on earth that are in heaven. We have that power and I was able to do that. And I realized that, oh my goodness, there's a thief trying to steal, kill and destroy my marriage. My kids are suffering at this stage. I have two kids, my two eldest, and they are suffering at this stage. There's somebody trying to rip us apart. And when I did this, when I broke down and I realized that the thief's fingerprints were on all of this, then I could bind it. I could bind him in the name of Jesus. I could control what was happening in the spirit world. Because it says here that if you catch the thief, if you catch him, he has to return to you sevenfold what you lost, what he took. My goodness, get excited. He has to return sevenfold what... Now, I didn't get seven wives back, right? Just let me point that out. But I can guarantee you my relationship is seven times better than it was. I would even go infinitely more better than it was. Beforehand... We never really saw things eye to eye. Now we're best friends. We can finish each other's sentences. And she does the dishes all the time. Perfect. And she makes me dinner all the time. And this is making me sound really sexist, but it's true. Anyway. And we have the best relationship. We really do. And I believe that it was when I realized that the thief had, who was responsible. Because I remember when all of this happened. The first person I yelled at was God and I know in my heart despite being safe it wasn't a very Christian thing that I yelled at him but I yelled at him because I was angry and I was hurt and I was thinking why is this taken away from me why is my relationship broken up what have I done but if you recognize the thief if you recognize his handiwork, if you recognize that there's a strategy to bring you down, break you down, crush you in your life, if you recognize it, then you can go, no, 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 no. I'm not letting this happen. I'm not letting this happen. In Jesus' name, I take authority. Luke 10, 19, I take authority over the serpents. I take authority over the demons. I take authority in the spiritual warfare. And I bind it in Jesus' name. And I say, no, I'm going to have sevenfold back. My goodness, it's brilliant. I get excited. Somebody steals from you. And if you recognize that it's the thief, then you can go, whoa, what's in? I get the sevenfold return. You see, God gives to you. He doesn't take away. This is not God who takes away. God is a restorer. His heart for you is for you to have an abundant life. If he came to give, let me see, he came to give you life, and life more abundantly. It doesn't say in any word in that verse that he came to get, take away your life. Or he came to give you abundantly and then just reduce it based on your behavior. See, that's another thing. Most of us think that we receive from God based on how good we are. Pardon the unchristian phrase. Boom. Right? You don't receive from God based on you being really well behaved. Because if you did, I'd be stuffed. Right? 
I, like, I, I admit it, my background was fighting. I had a temper. I had anger issues that if somebody cut me up on the road, all right, Simon, it'd be a bit like, yeah? I, I, it wouldn't have been a nice thing that came out of my mouth. And quite often I would be the person who would have stopped the car, got out, and got up to their window. And then realized I knew them. And, oh, do, aren't you a Christian? Yeah, so I just came to say hi and walk off. What I'm saying is, it is not based on your behavior whether you receive, because how you behave doesn't affect who God is. Who, what you do from Monday to Friday doesn't affect how God sees you. Because if you're born again, God sees the blood of Jesus Christ over you. He sees you in his son. And he sees his son covering you. And he sees you. And it's just like he said to his son. That he, you are his beloved. You are his beloved. Last week I shared, very briefly, that was said twice in the Bible. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well placed. At two different places. One the top, am I giving the fingers? Sorry. One, <laughs> at the top of Mount Hermon, at the Transfiguration, at the peak, at 10,000 feet above sea level. See, God loves you when you're doing well, yeah? God loves you when you're, you're, you're behaving well, you're, you're, you're doing the right thing. But it was also at the lowest point on earth, the Sea of Galilee, when he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. See, your behavior doesn't affect his love. Your behavior doesn't affect what he gives. Your behavior doesn't make him go, right, it's time to take away. Your behavior has nothing at all to do with it. In fact, it is all about him. And it's all about his nature. And his nature is to restore. His nature is to give. His nature isn't to hold back. And you know, a lot of us will go through things in life and we'll go, oh, I've lost this, I've lost that. Or maybe you don't have enough money to pay a bill. Anybody been there? That's what visas were created for, wasn't it? No, I'm joking. That's not scriptural. Um, if you don't have money to pay a bill, it's all about trust. Who are you trusting in? Are you trusting in God? Or are you saying, God, you wait, I'll do it myself. You see, he wants to give to you. He wants to restore to you. He wants to give you sevenfold. But he, there's two prerequisites on it. One, that you recognize it was never him that took it. You catch the thief. You realize that it was Satan who took away from you. It is God who gives back to you. And two, you rest. And when, do you, you know, all know the story of the, the 5,000, the feeding of the 5,000 with a couple of fish suppers. Whenever um, Jesus was about to give out to his disciples to distribute the food, whenever he took the, the loaves and the fish off the little boy, the first thing that he did, even before he blessed it, he says, tell him to sit. You see, if you're going to receive, if you're going to be restored, if you're going to get back what he took, then there's two things to do. One, realize A, who took it, and two, sit and relax and rest in God. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge Him. Trust in Him. Labor, according to Hebrews, labor to enter into His rest. Now, does that mean you do nothing? No. When I say rest, I mean that you don't worry, you don't stress. You don't do figures like uh, adding and subtracting a thousand times hoping for a different results when you're, you're broke. You don't go, all oh, right, how am I going to pay this bill? Let's take a loan. You trust. You go, God, I don't know how I'm doing it. I just don't know. So, go ahead. I trust in you. Think. Warren Buffett's son ever worries, or Bill Gates' son ever worries about paying the electric bill? Nah, because they know Dad's got a load of money. Dad's loaded. And it's the same for us. We shouldn't be worrying, we shouldn't be stressing, because all worry is, is meditating on fear. And according to 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, we do not have a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So if we don't have a spirit of fear, if that's not from God, we know that's from Satan. What's happening here? It's a strategy to steal. 
He wants to steal your peace, steal your joy. He wants to take everything away from you. But God's saying, no. If you realize it's him, if you realize who's taken it, honestly, I'll restore back to you sevenfold. All you got to do is realize it's Satan and then rest in me. It's that simple. There's no seven-step program. There's nothing that we have to um, figure out. There's no strategy to it. It's catch a thief and rest. Catch a thief and rest. Catch a thief and rest. You see, this happens, and I'm finishing now. This happens for a lot of Christians. Does anybody remember how it was when they got saved? How they felt? Yeah? Does anybody? It was good, wasn't it? Felt happy? There's a difference between happiness and joy. And it says in the Bible that he will restore the joy of your salvation. There's a difference between happiness and joy. We sang that song, Want to Be Happy? Happiness is based on your comfort. Joy is based on your knowledge. Happiness is based on you being comfortable. I'm happiest in a pair of boxers sitting with a remote and a Chinese in front of the TV. Right? Great visual image. I see you're going to be sick, Sharon. Sorry. <laughs> but that's, I'm happiest in that position. And when I was younger, I would have been happy, you know, breaking windows and jumping across sheds and doing things like that. But that's what would have made me happy. Happiness changes. It's what you're comfortable with. When you're comfortable with something at 20, you probably aren't comfortable at it when you're 30. Same when you're 40, same when you're 50, and so on. You're not comfortable in the same position. Happiness changes, it goes up and down. Joy is knowledge. Joy is found in knowledge. Knowledge. I can be joyful, even though I'm going through crap. I can be joyful that God's got my back. Even though my world is tumbling down, I can be joyful because it says in Psalms, in Psalm 37, that he lifts me up with his hand. Even though I may feel sick, I can be joyful because his word says that he heals all of my infirmities. Even though my relationship breaks up and I feel the spur and I feel the spondent and I'm breaking down and I'm losing myself, I can be joyful because my God is a God who restores. And when he gives back, it's always better than what you had. Joy is based on knowledge. Happiness is based on comfort. And most of us Christians and most of the people in the world, we're chasing happiness all the time. We're wanting to be happy. We're wanting everything to be perfect. And what the problem is, is if you're chasing that, when a problem happens, when the proverbial something hits the fan, you crumble. But joy is that constant line where you've got the knowledge, no matter what happens, I'm good. No matter what happens, he's got my back. No matter what happens, I'm lifted up. I'm set upon the solid rock. I'm established. See, Psalm 51 verse 12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. No one, I remember that day we got married in Seleucia. Very nice, by the way. All inclusive, recommend it. We got married in St. Lucia, and I remember that day getting up, and yeah, it was bright, but everything just seemed better. Everything just seemed clearer. Everything just seemed to have meaning because I'd given my heart to Him. But then what happens? You're saved, you come back, you meet another Christian. That Christian isn't perfect, got a few problems. They maybe tell you things in your life that you're doing wrong. In which case you sort of go, well, screw this. And then life happens. And you think that when you're saved, everything just becomes perfect. Everything lines up in a row. Happiness is a constant state. I walk along farting rainbows and smiling and singing zippity you that all my life. And we think that this is happening all the time. Because whenever I get saved, my life is just perfectly let out. He has not what God has promised. He has promised to restore your joy. He has promised you that if you take every promise he has ever given and realize his nature is a nature that restores, that gives back, then it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what comes into you. It doesn't matter what comes against you. 
The joy is found in the knowledge that he's got it all handled. That he's taken care of it and everything. There's nothing more you need to worry about. You can rest. Oh, happy day, happy day. You watch my sin away. Oh, happy day.